Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of the Articulate Fly. And on this episode, we're joined by Greg Wielander. Greg's the former fishing manager at Sportsman's Finest in Austin, Texas, and he's a hill country guide and manufacturer's rep. Join us as Greg shares his passion for the outdoors and the angling opportunities in Texas's hill country. But before we move on to the interview, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you like the podcast, please subscribe, please tell a friend, and please leave us a review in the podcatcher of your choice. We would really appreciate it. And also a shout out to this episode's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by our friends at PoseFly. Brian and his team make it easy for you to discover premium quality flies and gear with a box delivered to your doorstep every month. Check them out at www.postflybox.com and subscribe today. Now, on to the interview. Well, Greg, welcome to the Articulate Fly. Well, thanks, Marvin. I'm, I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation, and we have a tradition on the Articulate Fly. Uh, we always ask all of our guests to share their earliest fishing memory. Oh, wow, well, Marvin. Okay, that's that's a hard one. So, let, you know, I remember seeing pictures of when I was like four to five years old, you know, holding sunfish that I caught on a bobber with live worms. You know, you got to love the, the red and white bobbers. But uh, what really stands out in my in my memory was when I was about seven years old, my dad took me bass fishing. And back then I was using conventional gear and I caught my first big bass. You know, when I say big bass, it was probably about a three pound bass. And I caught it on a conventional lure called the jitterbug. And, you know, the image is still still with me today of, of that bass coming up, taking that topwater plug. Um, but, you know, growing up as a child, I, I've got a lot of memories of family trips, you know, with my dad you know, with my dad and my mom and, and even with my grandparents. And uh, as I started getting older as, as a child, you know, I started fishing with my, my neighborhood friends, you know. Yeah, that's neat. It's funny you talk about catching your first bass. My first bass was on a cane pole with a red bobber uh, on the Bicentennial on July 4th, uh, 1976. Um, wow. Yeah, but it wasn't three pounds. It was maybe 12 inches if I stepped on it. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, that was, that was the first bass that really made an impression on me, you know? So, well, uh, so when did you make the move to the dark side of fly fishing? Well, you know, I, I first picked up a, a fiberglass eight weight fly rod that, that had belonged to my dad at the time, you know, it's it kind of sitting in the corner of the garage. And, uh, that was back in the mid eighties, you know, I went, I went down to a dove hunting lease that, um, that we had down in South of San Antonio. And I started trying for bass with poppers, but, uh, what really, what really started, you know, fishing with the fly rod, you know, seriously is, is back in 1998. And that's, that was when I was employed, you know, in tech and it, and I would travel out to Colorado Springs. And I, I just remember, you know, after my first trip to Colorado Springs as a young adult, you know, in the working class, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the front range of the Rockies and it really had my interest up. You know, I'm like, I, I've, I've got to try fly fishing because, you know, relating fly fishing, trout fishing, that was kind of the, you know, the thought process back then. So um, on my next trip out to Colorado Springs, I stayed over for the weekend and I went down to the Angler's Covey uh, to check out on what the hatches were for that time of year. I remember it was in like September and my first trout came on the South Platte, just outside of Deckers, Colorado. And I remember the fly I was using. I was using the standard beadhead Prince Nymph. And that, that really got me hooked. You know, um, I got back to Texas and I, I just started warm water fishing around Texas, you know, basically chasing bass. And I uh, didn't limit myself to bass, though. You know, I started chasing just any, everything that swam in the water, you know, uh, remember chasing stripers on the red river below Lake Texoma, you know, all the sunfish and in the various waterways and even went after carp. Um, and Texas has got a, a rainbow trout fishery. It's just actually the southernmost trout fishery in the U S and that's called the Guadalupe river. And so on long weekends, I'd, I'd venture down there to chase the, the trout and, um, but those were, those were good memories of, of me starting in the fly fishing game. Yeah, that's neat. And who were some of the folks that mentored you as you grew as a fly angler? Well, I'm going to start off 
answer in that is, you know, my dad first introduced me to the outdoors. Okay. I mean, he taught me how to fish, but, um, you know, as a fly fisherman, I remember going in 1998 to meet with a guy named Craig Couch. Craig was in Fort Worth, Texas, and he owned uh, Main Street Outfitters. And that was a fly shop in downtown Fort Worth. And I bought my, my first setup. And, you know, I just, the next year, six years, I'd say, I started, you know, working on the process, you know, chasing warm water fish. But when somebody says, well, who is your mentor? You know, um, you know, Stephen, Stephen Woodcock out of Fort Worth, Texas, you know, I first met him when he was working at a local fly shop in Colleyville, and that's a little suburb there in Dallas, Fort Worth. And he was an instructor teaching fly tying classes that I started to attend on a weekly basis. And um, that's kind of where my passion turned into obsession. And I, I look up to a lot of the folks that worked in the shop, but I remember Stephen was the guy that just kind of really got me going um, on the fly rod. Yeah, that's really neat. It's always uh, great to hear about those special people that, you know, took an interest in you and helped you develop as an angler and outdoorsman. Um, you know, it's interesting, too. You mentioned that uh, you were in IT and, you know, you spent almost 30 years in the IT world. And, you know, all of us struggle because uh, we love to fish, but we have to make a living. You know, what made you uh, want to take that leap and make your passion your day job? Well, you know, Back back during the recession of 2008, um, you know, I found myself unemployed. I I had been working for Oracle Corporation for 10 years, and uh, I actually found another job in in IT, and um, happened pretty quick. But you know, after after a year being with this new company, just the frustrations and not enjoying the job, I thought I've I've got to try something new. Um, you know, I remember people always talking about you go through life and you do more than one thing. Well, I hadn't done that. You know, I spent, you know, going on 30 years, it was like 27 years doing one thing and one thing only. And that was it work. So, um, it's pretty safe to say unemployment gave me an opportunity to pursue a passion. And, um, I would tell my, my mentor, my friend, Stephen Woodcock, I said, I want to be like you. I want to be a fly fisherman. (laughs) And that's, that's what happened. Yeah. And so your first stop was at Sportsman's Finest in Austin. Tell us a little bit about your time there. Yeah, sure. So I, I remember going out to Sportsman's Finest and uh, visiting with uh, Stacy Lynn, who was the, uh, at that time, was the fly fishing manager. And, and I had known her for a few years. Um, and I told her I was interested in working at the shop, but I wasn't sure how long I was going to stay around. Um, and, you know, within the first month of employment, I started up a weekly fly tying uh, class. So every Tuesday night, we had a, a, fly, of, a fly of the week. And uh, I hosted that class for, for nine years that I worked for them. Um, I started out in four sales, and then I kind of was given responsibilities to start ordering fly tying materials and start ordering flies for the bins. And about two years go by, and uh, Stacy had moved into the general manager role of the store back then, and and I was promoted as the new as the new fly fishing manager, and and I held that position for seven years before leaving this past May of 2019. Yeah, and I know about that same time that you got promoted at Sportsman's, you started your own guide service upstream on the fly. What made you decide to become a fishing guide? Yeah, so you know, I, I love to fish. All right, so. On my days off from the shop, I would I would round up some friends or two and uh, take them out fishing. You know, I really enjoyed spending time on the water with people. I liked, you know, introducing people to new adventures, okay? And, uh, you know, a good friend of mine suggested, he said, hey, why don't you become a fishing guide? And I asked him, why is that? And he said, well, I caught more fish than anybody he knew. And I, and I laughed and I told him, I said, you know, guiding's more than just catching fish. And he said, no, no. He said, but, but more importantly, you know, you're extremely passionate about, about your adventures and your times on the water. Um, and I had the patience, you know, to help explain why I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, when it comes to being out on the water. Um, and while working in the fly shop, I'm constantly being asked, you know, day in and day out, oh, are you a local guide or, you know, can you take me out fishing? 
And I always said no. So I was giving out business cards for, for all the local guides. And, and Austin has a lot of solid guides. You know, it's amazing the culture of fly fishers that we have here. Um, and then it just happens. You know, I, I decided to go out and purchase a raft. I built my own website. And, um, of course, I had a full-time job at the shop. And so I was only kind of limited to guiding on my two days that I had off. Um, and that was kind of part-time. And um, I'm into my ninth year now as, as a fly fishing guide here in the Texas Hill Country. Yeah, and you know, and the Hill Country is a really special place. Can you tell us a little bit about the angling opportunities that are down there? Well, sure, Marvin. You know, the neat thing about Central Texas, the Hill Country you know, in particular, is the various types of fisheries we have. And we've got the Highland Lakes. There's there's seven of those um, from Lake Buchanan down to La- Lady Bird Lake, which is in downtown Austin. But some of my favorite waters are the granite and limestone rivers and creeks that we have in the area. Um, the Llano River, the San Gabriel River, the Lower Colorado River, you know, the Springfed River of the San Marcos are all kind of the primary fisheries in the area. Um, but let's, let, let me talk a little bit about the fish species that inhabit these, these fisheries. You know, we've got the, the largemouth bass, of course. But Texas has its own state fish, you know, the Guadalupe bass. And the the Guadalupe bass reminds me a lot of a smallmouth as far as, you know, where it lives, you know, what happens after you hook up with it. You know, it just has a mean attitude and just loves to fight. Um, You know, we're also we're also privileged to have a native cichlid species in central Texas, and that's called the Rio Grande cichlid. Um, We also have all the sunfish species. And all the trash species. And what I mean by trash fish species, you know, we've got carp, smallmouth, buffalo, gar, and even catfish, all all able to be caught on the fly rod. And um, about an hour south of Austin, we've got the uh, the southernmost um, trout fishery in the U.S., and that's the Guadalupe River, which, by the way, becomes extremely popular in November through through February. So a lot of diversity here in Central Texas. Yeah, and for folks that aren't familiar with that part of the United States, can you tell us kind of what the arc of the typical fishing season looks like? Yeah, um, you know, normally, if I'm going to start in the front of the year, okay, you know, white bass normally kick off the warm water fishing season, uh, which starts about now, kind of late February, um, and it continues into March. But however, as soon as, you know, the, the weather starts to warm, then the big bass start to bite and, and then the white bass fishing kind of becomes a memory, you know. Um, bass fishing will continue from March all the way into December, um, generally kind of slowing down in December when we start getting those, those harsh cold snaps. But um, we'll have those warming trends afterwards. You know, if you get three days of, of nice weather during the cold snap, uh, the, the bass will start to turn on. And, you know, we've, I've guided bass almost right up to Christmas time. Um, I've done a little guide in January, but typically I, I, I recommend January's just not the month to be out there chasing bass because of all the frequent cold fronts. And uh, it's really hard to get clients on bass at the time of year because you've got to have extreme flexibility to be able to get out on the, on the warm days. Uh, following those cold fronts in January. But, um, you know, July and August, we we get really hot. But uh, during those months, I I run some float trips on on a spring-fed river, which is the San Marcos River. It's it's a tree-lined river with a lot of cool spring water. So it's it's a great place to to beat the heat. You know, it's uh, it's real easy to just kind of get off the raft when we take a break on a shoal or something and just immerse yourself in the water. So it's, it's, it's a great, great thing to do in the middle of summer. Gotcha. And so, you know, can you kind of give us a little bit more detail, I guess, around kind of where you guide and your favorite species to guide for? Yes, Martin, I sure can. You know, um, one of my favorite fisheries is the lower Colorado river. And, uh, that's just east, east of Austin. Um, it's a tail race, but a tail race that, that, that contains largemouth bass, and the state fish of Texas, which is the Guadalupe bass. You know, the, the Colorado River is, is the river that, you know, makes up all the different highland lakes that I was talking about a little bit ago. Lake Buchanan, Lake Travis, um, 
But the lower Colorado, when you get east of town, it comes out of its last dam and it ends its life way down in the Matagorda Bay on, on our Texas coast. But uh, within about 30 minutes of downtown Austin, I've got, uh, you know, a location I put in and I've got some private land access and uh, we chased the Guadalupe bass and the, you know, you know, the Guadalupe bass, you know, that's where the state record came from on, on the lower Colorado. And it, it's just shy of four pounds. It came in about three and three quarters. Um, but I like to guide, you know, all the hill country streams. Everybody has heard about the Llano River, the San Gabriel River, the San Marcos River, um, and, and the Highland Lakes. You know, not a lot of folks fly fish the Highland Lakes, but um, I've been spending some time on those bodies of water. And during the spring and fall, Lake Buchanan, and Lake LBJ, Lake Marble Falls, and and even Lake Travis um, is uh, an awesome fishery for, for the fly rod. And I'm, and I'm basically chasing the largemouth bass, the Guadalupe bass, the Rio Grande cichlids, and all the, suns, all the sunfish species. And, you know, there's bonus catches. And I call bonus could be gars and smallmouth buffalo, freshwater drum. Uh, so we've got quite the robust fishery here in Central Texas. Very neat. And what can folks expect from a day on the water with Greg Wielander? Well, you know, it's it, it, no matter what your experience level is, um, I, I guide clients from beginners all the way up to, you know, seasoned, experienced anglers. Um, I will, I'll provide all the gear, fly rods, leaders, tippet, and flies. I offer float trips in a professional raft, you know, designed for floating our rivers. And in addition to my raft, I've also got a jet boat um, that fishes a lot like a bass boat. I've got an iPilot, Minnecota on the bow. So uh, this allows me to kind of sit in the center of the boat on my Yeti and um, control the boat with a remote control. And I've got an angler up front. I've got an angler in, in the back. Um, I'll do wade trips on a lot of the, the various rivers like the Llano or the San Gabriel. I offer full and half day trips. And on my full day trips, uh, I do provide lunch. And of course, all my trips include water and sport drinks. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy photography. So uh, I had an interest in photography back when I was finishing up high school. But college, work, just life in general kind of got in the, got in the way and photography took a back burner. And, uh, you know, sitting here with folks, seeing all these beautiful fish and I'm like, I've got I've got to get the cameras out. I've got to get back into photography. And um, and that gives me uh, an opportunity to give them something. You know, I give them a souvenir. I'm basically a souvenir in the, today's world is digital pictures so that they can share on their Instagram feeds or their Facebook feeds. But more importantly, they've got something to remember, remember the day on the water with, you know. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Yeah, that's neat. And, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier in the interview that you recently left Sportsman's Finest. And I think I bumped into you in Edison and you told me that you had uh, decided to become a manufacturer's rep. You know, what made you decide to take the leap and go work for yourself? Well, you know, um, I'm going to say I'm going to say timing. OK, so I once had an ex-boss tell me when an opportunity you know, when you have an opportunity presented, you only want to have that one opportunity and you either take it or you pass on it. So, it, you know, it's hard to say if you'll ever have that opportunity again. So, um, you know, it was a really big decision for me to leave the toy store. OK, and I call it the toy store because that's what it was. It was toys for, for, for the boys, you know, the big boys. Right. Um, I had a steady paycheck and, you know, going into the sales rep job is, you know, it's a commission based job. Um, if shops you know, aren't buying my product, then I'm not making money doing that. Um, but I saw an opportunity with some brands that did not have an area rep here in, in the Texas area. So I, I went for it. And uh, along the way, I started acquiring other brands in both fly fishing and in the outdoor space to, uh, to work with. That's really interesting. And what's been the biggest surprise for you in the transition? Well, you know, I don't think there was really any surprises. You know, since since I was a buyer at a shop, I, you know, I understood the sales rep process, you know, from having worked with so many of the top sales reps in the industry. Um, I, I understand what my client, which is actually the buyer at the fly shop, deals with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. 
they're, they're extremely busy. They're maintaining inventory. They're working with customers. They're dealing with all the different orders coming in. They're having to worry about marketing, you know, managing personnel. Um, there, there's so many variables that come in a day to day is working in the shop. So I understand all that. And, and that really helps, helps me, um, in being a successful sales rep, uh, for, for my dealers. Yeah. And I think, you know, all of us that have been around the industry are sort of familiar with the manufacturer's rep and sort of what they do, but what's the typical day like for you? Okay. So I'm going to start off answering that with three words, availability, flexibility, and patience. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit about that. So availability and or follow-up. Okay. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, being available to my fly shops, you know, getting back to the customer's voice messages, text messages, you know, emails, all in a timely manner. Um, and then flexibility. You know, I, I've got a home office here. So um, sometimes, you know, what that means is, you know, once you have laid out for the day, sometimes you've got to totally divert and put that on the back burner and, and, and address the issue because you maybe got a new email or you got a new phone call from, from one of your, your dealers and it's extremely important to, to manage, you know, what I, what I call my to-do list. So, I've, you know, I have meetings with dealers. I've got to, you know, walk away with a to-do list. I want to make sure I follow up and, and get everything that I've said I would do or any, answer any questions that they might have had. Um, and the last thing's patience. So the length of the sales cycle um, it is not a short process. You know, from the time you show a buyer a product, to when or you know when he or she actually submits the order, it's it's just not an overnight process. But you know, patience. You know, we've got patience because why? We're in anglers, so uh, it just kind of comes naturally, I guess. Got it. And you know, you represent some really great brands. Can you give our listeners just kind of a brief overview of the folks that you work with? Yeah, sure. You know, um, I work for Thomas and Thomas Fly Rods. I've got, uh, which is out of Massachusetts, um, Sigler, Sigler Reels. They're based out of uh, West, or out of, actually out of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, Dagon Apparel, that's out of Houston, Texas. And I've got Frog here, uh, Leaders and Tippet. Um, and they've also got another company called Gamma Braid uh, and, and Line for, uh, conventional, for the conventional market. Um, I'm working for Monic Fly Lines. It's a fly line company out of Boulder, Colorado. I've got Renzetti Vices and our distribution, which is the uh, Renzetti's uh, fly tie-in uh, material uh, distributor, um, distributor rather, um, race of flies. So I'm, I'm selling flies uh, wholesale to, to my dealers. And I've also got Head Spin Outdoors. So that's a convertible lighting system for the outdoor company, and it's based out of Dallas, Texas. So that, that was one of my first brands that wasn't maybe just tied in specifically with fly fishing. Um, you know, it's it's for anybody. It's it's for the for the guy out there fishing. You know, both conventional fly for the hunter. You know, for even for people at the house. You know, for a home light system. Uh, I kind of call it the GoPro of the lighting system. But um, check out Headspin Outdoors. Boat Rock Outdoors, which is a uh, startup company here in Austin, Texas. They've got hats and T-shirts. Deny Locks. Deny Locks is based out of San Antonio, Texas. And that's the lock that keeps your Yeti secure on a flat surface. Um, It's really the first lock company that I've seen that you can't cut with a pair of bolt cutters. Um, And Deny Locks works for like all the 59 other Yeti light coolers that are on the market. Um, it'll secure you, your Yeti or your high dollar, you know, cooler to any flat surface, whether it be a bed of a pickup, a deck of a boat, or even a dock on, on your lake house. And let's see, sightline provisions. Um, I'm not really a sales rep for them. Uh, we've already got a sales rep in Texas, but I, I kind of serve the U S accounts kind of in the remote back office in-house kind of a dealer services role. Um, but Sightline Provisions is out of Austin, Texas, and you got to love Edgar. You know, he's got some really, he's got really cool bracelets and the cuffs and watch bands and even dog collars now. So 
Yeah, it's a super neat uh, company, and I'll drop links to all of those in the show notes, um, so it'll be easy for our listeners to go check them out. And, you know, I know, obviously, um, some of those brands, you have a territory, some of them are national, kind of, what do you, where do you, uh, where do you sell those items? Well, for, for the majority of my brands, you know, I, I represent the TALO. Uh, TALO kind of stands for Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Um, with, with Texas really being the, the big, you know, the big territory, um, you know, I always say Texas is, is, is a whole nother country. It's so big. You can drive all day just in Texas. Um, but it helps live in centralized, you know, out of the Austin area. Um, but I've got Dagon Apparel. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of working that throughout the U S. Um, and, um, other than that, everything else is, is in the Talo district. Yeah. Got it. And, you know, one question, um, I always ask all of my fishing guide guests is to share their, what they think the biggest misconception is people have about their life as a guide. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, you know, um, Let's see. Um, let's see if I can how I can articulate that one. Um, you know, you know the biggest misconception of, of being a guide is 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 basically you're a person that takes people fishing. You know, um, there's really a lot more to that. Um, you know, a guide's day is a long day. It's more than just just hours spent with the client. There's there's shopping for food. There's making your gear ready, you know, keeping the boat clean, keeping it maintained. You know, these are all things that you're doing, you know, before and, and after a day's trip. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the time involves in helping the client, you know, with, with his, his or her cast out on the water, um, helping them learn where the fish live, you know, why one fly or technique is, is working over another one. Um, a, a guide is a lot like a teacher. I always like to ensure that everyone on my trip always learns something new, you know, just besides catching fish. Um, you know, being a fly fishing guide is being good at customer service. You know, you spend eight hours on a boat, on the water with someone, and you better have good people skills. So a guide is more than just taking a person fishing. Got it. And, you know, we're obviously, this is, we're recording this in late February. We're kind of getting to the tail end of show season, but I bet you probably have some upcoming speaking engagements or show appearances you'd like to share with our listeners. You know, I do. Um, there's actually, I've got, I've got five events coming up. Um, I've got the fly fishing, the, or not the fly fishing, but the fishing show in Houston, Texas, which is going to be held at the George R. Brown Convention Center. That's on March 4th through March 8th. And I'll be working uh, the Dag on Apparel booth for this show. Um, the show's not just fly fishing specific. Um, it also includes a lot of conventional gear. Um, the Texas Fly Fishing and Brew Fest in Plano, Texas. That's coming up on March the 20th through the 22nd. I'll be working the, the booth for, for Dag on and also be spending some time over at Headspin Lights, Headspin Outdoors. Um, on Sunday morning, I'm giving a presentation uh, from 10 to 10.50 in the morning, and I'm going to be talking about fly fishing in the Texas Hill Country. And one of my big dealers, uh, Bayou City Anglers, is having a vendor day at their shop over in Houston, Texas, and that's on May the 2nd. So I'll be on site there representing my brands uh, that they actually carry. Um, and then there's Dallas. The Dallas Fly Fishers Club meeting is on June the 1st. And I'll be presenting a uh, presentation on fly fishing in the Texas Hill Country. And the next day, I'll be over in Fort Worth on June the 2nd. And I'll also be doing the same presentation on uh, fly fishing in the Texas Hill Country. And when I used to live up in North Texas, I, I was a member of the Fort Worth Fly Fishers. And you know, that's probably one of the largest clubs I've ever seen. I think they've got a current membership of like 300 members. So Texans take fly fishing very seriously. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. I will drop links to all those events in the show notes. So folks, if you're listening and you want to get more information, just check out the show notes and the podcatcher of your choice and uh, we'll point you in the right direction. And before I let you go tonight, Greg, why don't you let folks know where they can find you to learn more about your guide service and your manufacturer's rep business? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a website, of course, and that's upstreamonthefly.com. Um, however, that's that's talking more primarily about my guiding. Um, I am on Facebook. I'm on Instagram as Upstream on the Fly. But I've even got a, a page over on LinkedIn, um, which talks more about my manufacturer rep business. Um, however, though, I've, I've recently set up a new company page over on LinkedIn for Upstream on the Fly, which I will uh, talk about about the guiding and the fishing here in the hill country. So uh, that pretty much sums that up. Um, where you can reach me. Yeah, and I'll drop all that stuff in the show notes. And uh, Greg, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me this evening. Well, Marvin, I appreciate you having me on the show, and I, I was really looking forward to it. Um, I, I enjoyed enjoyed the time today. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Again, if you liked it, please subscribe in the podcatcher of your choice and leave us a review. And again, a shout out to this episode's sponsor, our friends at Postfly. Check them out at www.postflybox.com. Tight lines, everybody. Mm-hmm.